Well, then, to, to start to segue into uh, the broader debate to include China, do you think the reaction, there would have been genuine surprise in Russia and, for that matter, Beijing, at the way most of the world has responded? Uh, you've had American leadership, you've had surprising responses from Germany, although I don't know whether they'll follow through, mm -hmm. and from NATO. Uh, and, and, and the response is not something I would have foreseen, and it's... Well, what would what, do you, what would you, what would you not have foreseen? To uh, find what it is, you would not, because I'm not sure. I would have thought they, that, that there would have been an, a greater reluctance to supply arms, more particularly uh, that they that you wouldn't have seen pretty widespread sanctions, even though it appears, for example, that Germany's effectively funding the war effort at the same time as they're putting some arms into the Ukraine. They're paying a lot of money on a daily basis for resources out of Russia. Well, I think they'd have an economic collapse if they didn't, because you, without energy, their economy would stop functioning. Mm -hmm. But I, the, the, that's, there is a great complexity in the German-Russian relationship, which nobody should need to be surprised by. I don't know. I mean, I think people feel at the moment safe that as long as they don't actively enter the war with, um, with the open deployment of troops, uh, that it won't widen. I, I take the I'm point. not sure that they're right. Well, they've got theatre war, uh, nuclear war bombs, haven't they? I mean, oh, a lot yeah. of them. The West has hardly any. We don't know about that. Well, those. I like to think that the nuclear um, option is... Um, and I think, I think my own view is that Putin went to some extent off his head when he decided to invade. I don't think he's mad in the sense that he's smearing his own excrement on his bedroom walls or anything like that. But I think that he, he, he has lost touch with reality to some extent. But I don't think he's lost touch with reality to the extent that he, he doesn't know that going nuclear would be a, a, a suicidal act. I, I live in hope that that's so, because if he if he hasn't if he doesn't still make that distinction, then we probably all are finished. You know, you hear this talk that they've got these much smaller nuclear bombs that nobody's really focused on that could take out a town or a village. Well, the, the, it's not the same as saying, you know, if we attack New York and bomb it out, then Moscow. Yeah, gone. but it's true. But I mean, modern conventional weapons are, are tremendously powerful as well. Yeah, and can do at that, that. at that level. Can do. There's not. I wouldn't have thought there was any would it be any military justification in using nuclear weapons when you could when you have ex the extraordinarily powerful conventional ones which we possess anyway, it's a political step. Once you've used a nuclear weapon, you, again, you have no idea when the, when the process will stop. And I, almost any, any sane political leader, however nasty he may be, must realize that. Well, we certainly hope so. We have to hope so. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, but I, I, as I say, I think that he has, he has lost touch with reality, but I don't think he's lost touch with reality to that extent. And if I'm wrong, well, there won't really be much point in having many discussions about it, will there? No, there won't, tragically. Now, now to pivot to Beijing, how do you think they'd see all of this? They'd become very close. The Prime Minister of Australia talks about the emerging arc of autocracy. It's not a bad term in a way, it seems to me. It's a bit um, like the axis of evil, isn't it? <laughs> well, nonetheless, <laughs> it underlines that this is really serious. And we've seen them, you know, the two countries draw... Very close, no better friends and all the rest of Right, I, let's not exaggerate this. I mean, the, the, the fundamental relationship between, between Russia and China is one of hostility over the, 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 the territory seized by the Russian Empire from China mm. uh, under unfair treaties, as the Chinese view it, so, centuries ago, and they want it back. My enemy's friends are mine. Well, I don't think there's any great, and also it, it, China is immensely more economically and uh, diplomatically powerful than, than Russia. Russia can only be a client of China's. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that the, the, the Chinese would see particularly uh, any political desire to help Russia because they're a fellow despotism. I think uh, it's, in fact, Russia still just about has some remaining forms of democracy and free speech, so they're rapidly disappearing, and is in many important ways a very different sort of society from China, but. I would have thought there were some conveniences, and particularly uh, China has always been short of energy. Uh, there are some conveniences in the relationship, but I wouldn't go much further than that. I would, I, and also, I don't think that if Taiwan put in an application for NATO membership, it would be favorably considered. <laughs> That's right. But you, to come back to something... In fact, perhaps you... they should try and see what happens, because it would be an <laughs> interesting illustration of just how far this, uh, this, this supposed shield would be extended and how principled it really is. Um, to come back to something you said, touched on earlier, it's very interesting the contrasting way in which we condemn Russia 
for every ill, mm. serious and imagined. And yet we let China off. Perhaps, you know, the answer is in what you just said. They're diplomatically and economically much more powerful. Yeah. But you stop and think about it. There's, there's the barbarity that it displays towards its own citizens uh, and, and, and to its non-citizens that it claims as theirs in various satellite states. You've got the South China Sea, where the Chinese endlessly lecture us on international norms no, 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 so the, 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 the blatantly mm. racialist imperialism going on in Xinjiang towards the Uyghurs is just is astro- astonishing. Mm. Uh, so we turn ourselves inside out looking for is, racism in what, our culture. We, we, you know, we look back at the history of the, of, of, of the, of the European empires and the horrible things that they often did, uh, and, and we make a great uh, fuss about it, and quite rightly so. And we must remember these things so we don't do them again. When China does what it's doing to the Uyghurs, uh, there is a sort of, oh, well, this is terrible, uh, paper condemnation, but no real change. In attitudes. The, to me, all this is... Um, it, it, so much of this outrage is, is, is ultimately phony because it's not consistent. If you hate uh, aggressive war, then you hate it whoever does it, and you condemn it whoever does it. Uh, and you know, we, if you hate despotism, then you hate it everywhere. So it really isn't much of a thing, is it? If Germany switches its, its, uh, its main supply of fuel from the Russian despotism to the Saudi despotism, but we make out that it's a difference. I don't quite know why. Uh, I, th- there's, there's, a, there's a lack of true principle in so much of this, which, 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 which makes me feel faintly ill. And we, uh, the, the number of regimes which the West props up, supports, or, or refuses to criticize, with the Sisi's military dictatorship of Egypt, which again massacred its own people in, blatantly in Cairo, or particularly the Saudi state, which, which murders its opponents and actually cuts them up into pieces in its own consulates. I, if we if we really are if, if we really have this these these um, these feelings of revulsion as a matter of principle, then we have to express them in all occasions. And again, with with I read you know, this terrible story of this 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 family in Odessa destroyed the other day by a, a, a Russian missile, and it, it, it makes you weep. But how many people are aware of what happened when British and French jets bombed Libya? I mean, there were horrible things happened then, which were, were reported lightly in the Western press. If you if you hate these things, you hate them wherever they are. You mustn't just use them as a way of of, of working yourself up into a, into a frenzy about a particular political objective you may have now. You have to hate them universally. It does seem to me that you know we've been talking about how the West did not help Russia when it sought to democratize. Very different in the case of China, where there was a view, perhaps naive, perhaps driven by self-interest, perhaps even by greed, but there was a view that if we traded, if we recognised, traded, and worked with them, as their living standards rose, as they felt more secure in themselves, they would liberalise. Yeah. Whereas in reality, we know now that we took our eyes off the ball, forgot. If you like the real nature of communism, so it's not. We're not talking about the Chinese people here. We're talking you remember about. Remember going to Shanghai for the first time. Must be about coming up to twenty years ago now, and being terrified because here was the absolute proof that the theory that if you give a man a Mercedes, he'll become a democrat, it's not true. Here was this city of immense uh, modern prosperity and, uh, and and capitalist growth, and to get rich was glorious. But there wasn't the faintest trace of freedom of the press or freedom of thought or expression uh, of democratic governance or of the rule of law. It was a secret police tyranny, and yet it was prosperous. And that, that, that idea died with amazing speed. But although it died, I didn't see anybody much making any sense of the fact that it wasn't true. The, the, the willingness to accept that China was there and that was pretty much beyond criticism, that we would hand Hong Kong over to it, that when China broke its agreements blatantly about, uh, about even leaving Hong Kong free for 50 years, we wouldn't do anything, which we didn't. Do you know what I mean? I mean it's just, it, it, if, if, you're, if, it's, if it's a principle, it's a principle. It applies everywhere. If it's not a principle, then what is it? Mm. I mean, in, in a sense, I think what you're referring back to is that freedom only works when we genuinely respect every other human being properly. And that was really the, you know, the great experiment in democracy. Well, Russia, that created the- I, think Russia, I think Russia was open uh, in 1991. I think Russia was open to the ideas of yeah. freedom. Yeah. 
I think it, the, the, the great tragedy of 1917, uh, the suppression of the Constituent Assembly, is too little known about. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 there is, there's still an idea that the, the ridiculous Eisenstein propaganda film of, of October 1917, in which the revolution is portrayed as a mass uprising and the storming of the Winter Palace, is still widely believed as a complete lie. Well, of course it is. I mean, uh, but, but what, what had happened was, as I say, an extraordinarily well conducted election over the whole vast mass of Russia in the middle of a very bitter war after the Tsar had been overthrown, uh, successfully elected a constituent assembly, which just didn't happen to have enough Bolsheviks in it for mm -hmm. Lenin to be pleased. So he shut it down. Uh, he, he destroyed the first meeting by planting clacks in it, and he shut it down with the bayonets of Kronstadt sailors, and it was killed. Uh, but Russia was quite capable. The idea it was too backward to cope uh, with the idea of liberal democracy is false. Uh, Russia had in it, in 1917, a democratic spirit, which could, in my view, have been revived. 